Okay, welcome everybody to our fitness swimming webinar. We're just going to give it a couple of minutes to let you all in. I can see all the participants flooding through. So if you just bear with us and we will get started once we've got everybody in. Okay, I can still see that people are coming in whilst we're waiting, just to let you know, we are going to be recording today's session. So I know we've had a number of inquiries of people that are actually at work, but are really keen to hear what we're all talking about. So we will be sharing a link to the recording um, with everybody that's registered for today's session. If you want to use the chat function to tell us where you're all from, then by all means, let us know. We can see where you're from, from around the country. Tracy, we've got a question here for you. Have you swum <laughs> Escape from Alcatraz? Is your picture trying to tell us something? From no, I haven't. <laughs> no. Okay, welcome, Rebecca from Greenwich. Colette from Cornwall. Hi, RT from London. Yeah, I think we're all missing swimming, Abigail. Definitely, you're in good company there. Hi, Team West Rose. <laughs> ah, someone who's from Cambridge who has escaped from Alcatraz. Excellent. <laughs> Great. Good stuff. Looks like we've got people from all over. Yeah, I'm missing Charlton Lido too, and I definitely know that Tracy is. Yeah, me too. <laughs> okay, we've got just over 180 people that have joined us now, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think we're going to get started so that we can make the most of the time that we've all got together. Um, as I've said, if you want to use the chat function to tell us where you're from and to say hello to everybody, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, what I would ask is if you've got any questions for the panellists, if you can put them in the Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen, um, and I'll keep an eye on those as we're, as we're going through. Um, so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us. My name's Emma Lewis and I'm National Aquatics Manager um, for Better UK. So swimming is my day job, but swimming is also one of my hobbies as well. So you have got three ladies here who are very passionate about swimming and, and really keen to talk to you about what we've been doing and what you can do to keep yourselves fit whilst unfortunately our pools are closed. Um, so I'd also like to introduce you to Carrie ann Payne, who is our um, Better Fitness Swimming Ambassador. Hi, Carrie ann welcome. And also Olympic silver medalist and two-time 10K open water swimming world champion. So welcome. Um, and Tracy White, who is our resident swim doctor at Charlton Lido and Lifestyle Club. So runs our weekly um, coach swim doctor sessions at the Lido for us. Um, so we can't see you, unfortunately, but hopefully you can all see us. We are, just to remind you, we are recording today's session. We will share the link with you afterwards and we'll no doubt be posting it on our website as well. So if you're not able to stay for the whole session, you can catch up on it later. Um, if you've got any questions, put them in the uh, Q&A at the bottom. 
Um, and what we're going to take you through today is three different areas of swimming that we're going to focus on. So first of all, we're going to look at breathing. Secondly, we're going to look at body position. And finally, we're going to look at propulsion. And what we're also going to do is take you through some um, land training exercises that are focused on, on these three areas. If you pop your questions in the Q&A and I will pick them up as we go along if they're relevant to the section that we're talking about. If not, we'll pick them up at the end and make sure that we leave some space at the end for, for the questions. Okay, so I'm gonna hand over first to Kerry ann who's going to talk to us about breathing. Hi everybody, thank you so much for all the people that have joined us today. Um, and if you're watching this back again, thank you very much for watching it back. So today, well, when Emma approached myself and Tracy about doing this webinar, um, we were all in agreement that it would be really great if we could figure out a way of keeping you guys fit and healthy and maintaining fitness as much as possible. But how can we do that on land that can best either replicate or help us to be better when we get back into the water, whenever that is? Um, so the thing that we, discussed was that um, the way that I coach, so a little bit of background around, around me when I retired from competitive swimming, I now work with the Swimming Teachers Association uh, and I deliver an open water coaching qualification. And I also deliver um, some CPDs around front crawl technique, but all the things that we're gonna talk about today are absolutely relevant for all the strokes. And those three things are breathing into your body position and then into propulsion. Um, I'm gonna start with breathing and you might be going, come on, we're all adults, we know how to breathe, but it is the number one thing that either stops people from learning how to swim in the first place, going from either breaststroke to front crawl or from getting faster or being able to swim for longer. And what I'm gonna to do today is I'm gonna talk a little bit about the technical aspects. And then Tracy's gonna talk us through some things that you can do on land that can help you prepare and be better for that specific thing. And then when you get into the water, hopefully you'll feel that the benefits of doing fitness training on land. So starting with breathing, again, as I said, it usually is the number one thing that stops people from either getting fast or getting into the water. And there's a couple of different reasons. The first one, this thing. Unfortunately, our brains like to play tricks on us, especially when it comes to something like water. We automatically, because technically we're not really meant to be in the water. We don't have gills. So our brain automatically goes, I might not get another breath anytime soon. So what I'm going to have to do is take it all in. <gasps> and people, when I, I, quite often hear them before I can see people do that when I'm walking up and down a poolside doing some coaching or on, on the side of a lake doing some coaching. And the thing with breathing that I wanted us to talk about today is it's not just about trying to suck as much air into your body as possible. It's about being really controlled and calm with your breathing. Now, most people, when they're on land, um, they will, uh, you know, when you're doing any land-based exercises, their breathing will generally sort of sit into a rhythm because you have to be able to maintain a certain amount of effort and energy over a long period of time. But when people get into the water, that's sometimes completely thrown out of the window. So what uh, we were talking about, what Tracy and I was talking about when it comes to breathing and the exercises that, that this would be really beneficial to do is to do any kind of cardio. So any cardio work that you can do to, to generally improve your fitness. If your fitness is really good on land, even if it's not great on land, you'll still be able to swim really well. But let's use the time that we have now to increase and improve our cardiovascular fitness. Now, the things that I really want you to think about and focus on, it's how you breathe whilst you're doing these on land exercises. And that goes for the easy stuff as well as for the hard stuff. And what I want you to do is take a, take a check, take a conscious check on your body, what you're doing when you're doing something steady, how many seconds does it take you to breathe in? How many seconds does it take you to breathe out? How much are you filling your lungs? How much are you emptying your lungs? And then the same thing when you're doing a medium type exercise and then the same thing when you're doing quite a high, high intensity interval training. So if you're doing any HIIT workouts or anything, take a check on what your breathing is doing there. And ultimately what we're trying to do is replicate land-based breathing in the water. If you're trying to do something completely different, if you're maybe taking in a huge breath and doing eight strokes without taking a breath or even five strokes without taking another breath, would you be doing that on land? And if you wouldn't be able to sustain that type of breathing on land, unfortunately, you're never gonna be able to sustain that type of breathing in the water. So for me, it's really about making sure that you can, um, that you're thinking about your breathing 
on land and how we can replicate that into the water. And having said that, I'm going to pass over to Tracy um, for some of the exercises that you thought might be helpful for this bit. Yeah, thank you very much. So with uh, breathing and cardio, land-based is much easier for you to interval training. So the kind of exercise I've proposed are um, indoor jogging on the spot, maybe do one minute of that and then go on to something that's much easier, like a squat for one minute, so that you're staggering, you're fast breathing and then you're slow breathing and having to think consciously about it. And then going back to another jog on the spot for a minute and then onto something else um, like lunges for another minute so that you've constantly having to think, right, I need to breathe here. Um, it's a fast exercise, but also breathing out when you're doing the work and breathing in when you've got your rest gaps in between. I'm counting how long that you are breathing out for. So 10 seconds, breathe out, 10 seconds, breathe in while you're jogging on the spot. And then with your squats, so you're breathing out when you go down and breathe in when you come back up again. Great. So, yeah, so with that one, it's about really thinking about how you're breathing, how much you're breathing in, how much you're breathing out. Um, the other thing that's swimming related that I'll just finally touch on with breathing and the thing that does help a lot of people is two things. One is just to, to either remind you or to let you know that the best way of doing that when we're on land, we're breathing in and we're breathing out, we're breathing in. It's quite a consistent process. So when you're swimming, when you're breathing, either doing front core, breathing to the side or breaststroke or backstroke, looking forward, you're breathing in when your head is out of the water. But then when your face goes into the water, we're breathing out then. And the best way to help with the controlling of the breath out, so there's no explosive breathing, you're not breathing out too much, is to actually start breathing out of your nose. Now, that might be quite interesting for a few people if you've never done that before. So we breathe in the mouth, out the nose, or a breaststroke in the mouth, out the nose when the face comes in. Now, the good thing about that is it regulates the breath out. If it's more of a trickle, it means that we're not forcing too much oxygen out because if you force too much out, then you have to... <gasps> very quickly breathe too much back in. So it's about making sure we can maintain a nice rhythm. The other thing is that our noses are one-way systems. If we're blowing bubbles out the nose, water can't go up the nose, which for me is always a benefit, making sure water does not come up my nose. Uh, Emma, have there been any questions so far on, on breathing or anything to talk about with that? Um, yeah, there's a, a question from Philip who's asking whether skipping would be a good activity to do to help with this. Definitely. Yeah, like, like Tracy said, any kind of interval training will be really great. Um, any sort of cardiovascular work that you're going to do. If you haven't done much of it, it's definitely worth doing what Tracy said and, and mixing it up. So still doing an exercise, but an active recovery exercise. So we're still doing something like a squat. Um, and then you can bring your breathing back into to normal again, and then you can go back up with the high intensity, think about your breathing, keep it controlled, and then you can take a second to calm it back down again. Great, well, we'll move on then, I think. Move on then to the next part. Um, Emma, is it all right if you did that poll now, just so we can get an idea if you if you created it? Yeah, absolutely. While Emma's doing that poll, I, had a, I saw one question come up talking about speaker view. Um, if you're using a computer or an, um, there should be something around there that says either gallery view or speaker view, it's a little button, usually on the top right hand side, or if you're on an iPad or phone, it's usually on the left hand side. You just click on that and then you can click it to either gallery view or whatever else you want, um, but that will just help you there. Great, so I'll just quickly touch on body position then when Emma gets all those results in, she can let us know what happens there. So the second part that we work on um, is, is our body position. So breathing is a thing, if you think about it as like building a house, breathing is like the solid foundations. If your breathing isn't very good or you're hyperventilating yourself constantly, though that, that structure at the bottom is gonna be a bit rocky, a bit shaky. So once we've worked on that, we can then work on the structure of your house. And this is body position. And for me, body position is broken up into two, um, two separate areas. The first area is our head position and how much our head plays a massive role in, in the drag that our body creates. And the second thing is rotation. So I'm just briefly gonna to touch on head position. Now, when we're swimming in the water, next time you get a chance to go, have a play around with your head position so that you can really understand the difference in looking forward, head out of the water, head under the water, going too far down. Awareness when it comes to swimming technique and swimming is gonna be such a huge thing to help you improve. If you can find one way that feels a little more comfortable that feels like your legs aren't dragging along the floor quite so much or that your legs aren't sinking quite so much that's going to be a really good way 
of helping you figure out how you can do that. Um, so with head position, the one of the best things that we can do on land to help us figure out what is going to be best for that is generally thinking about spines being as neutral as possible. So we're not thinking about heads going up like this. We're not hunching shoulders. We're not bringing heads too far forward like that. If we can think about being a nice neutral spine um, when we're doing things like our squats, making sure that we're not hunching forward when we come down, making sure that all the exercises you're doing, you're concentrating on first of all, your breathing, and then second of all, bring your awareness to what your body's doing. If you're hunching, if you're coming up like that, all those sorts of things, the more time we can spend thinking about having a nice neutral spine, that's gonna have a real benefit for you when you get back into the water and you can work on head position. And um, Tracy, do you have um, any anything else to add on the, on the head position piece and, and some exercises that might be able to help with that? Yeah, so um, some really good exercises to practice at home. Uh, the first simple one I'm gonna give you is lay on the floor. On your tummy, lay on the floor. Um, your um, elbows tucked in, lift your head up and then bring it down and also to the sides. And you'll be able to feel where your spine's in alignment before you even do any exercise. And then once you've done that, come up into a plank position. Now with plank, it's really important that you keep your spine in a straight line. Your bottom's not too far up or too far down. Um, with plank, just hold it for as long as you can to start with. Don't do too much um, and then rest, come down and then do, it's easy to do more sets of a little bit of plank than it is to do a really long plank and do it completely wrong. You should also be pulling your core in when you're doing the plank exercise as well. Um, and you can either do it on your elbows or on your hands. There's no right or wrong way for this one. Um, another really good one for this is to do a Superman, which is where you are almost in a plank position. And then you lay on the floor, bring your arms back and then come back up again. Um, it just helps to balance your body and make sure you're not twisting or rotating left or right a bit. From there, you can go into a side plank and this will help with your rotation and the way your head's positioned or even if you don't want to be doing anything on your on your arms, you can do a Russian twist, which is where you sit on your, you sit back on your bottom, uh, knees bent, and then you're twisting from side to side with both hands going in the same direction at the same time. So it's kind of like this movement all right across the screen. Great, excellent. Some really good stuff there. Again, that spinal alignment, the keeping a neutral spine as much as possible. That If that can be your starting point, and then when you get back into the water, it's just worth playing around with those sorts of things. What we do know about our bodies is that essentially they're seesaws. So, you know, if I was to think about this being body position here, the higher up the head is, the lower down the legs are gonna be behind that. That's just the way our bodies work. It's not something that we can really control that much. Another great exercise for you guys to do, maybe practice this at home, is just to stand, st stand up straight, looking forward directly in front of you, nice neutral spine, put one hand in front of your waist, one hand behind your back, and basically just look up to the sky. And when you look up to the sky, just see what happens to your hips and you'll you should be able to feel that your hips go a little bit forward and that's just going to give you an idea of how much of an impact your head position lifting up is going to have on your legs behind you so the first thing about body position is making sure that we try and keep you nice and flat in the water and the flatter we are the more streamlined we're going to be and ultimately the easier it's going to feel for you to move through the water which I'm gonna let you into a little secret. Swimming shouldn't be hard. Swimming shouldn't be a sport that you're fighting your way through the water. And if you are fighting, it's probably because there's some sort of drag that you're causing by body position or by something else. So swimming should feel easy. And if you can get your body into a really good position, minimize that drag as much as possible, you'll definitely start to feel the benefits of that. And then Tracy just touched upon then uh, rotation. Now rotation is such a key part within swimming and it wasn't actively taught quite a long time ago because of the way that swimming was taught, you know, sort of 40, 30, 40 years ago. Um, rotation was, was not really mentioned that much, but what we know now is that rotation really helps for us to stay nice and flat in the water whilst we take our breath. Now, usually when it comes to rotation, this is one of the things that stops people from being able to breathe bilaterally. When we say bilaterally in front crawl, we mean being able to breathe both ways. Some people find it really easy to breathe one side and some people really struggle to breathe the other side. And a lot of the time it's because, you know, you've got a really tight neck or you've got a really bad shoulder or something along those lines. Now I'm going to let you into another little secret. Your neck shouldn't really be moving when you're breathing. Ultimately, the thing that's moving when we're taking our breath is our full body. And that's coming from the rotation. 
So the rotation of the body essentially is moving, sorry, my chair's a bit squeaky, is moving everything to the side so that your neck doesn't have to move. And then you come back down and then everything, you know, moving across the other side. And if you can start to improve your rotation, you'll definitely start to feel the benefit of being able to breathe both ways. And the last thing I'm gonna talk about when it comes to that bilateral breathing is that it, it's, not, it's not necessary. A lot of people spend so many years trying to fight with themselves to be able to breathe bilaterally. It's not the be all and end all. A lot of the best swimmers in the world, if you watch the Olympic finals of most of the, um, the freestyle events, most of the elite athletes will be breathing one way because they feel comfortable that way. But if you are looking to take that on, and for me, my personal interest in this is the open water. So if you are gonna be going into the open water, being able to breathe both ways would be really helpful for all the different types of conditions you might have from the waves to the sun. So it is a good skill. And if you're struggled with it for a long time, rotation is the thing that's gonna help you to do that. Now, coming back to the fitness angle and how we can maintain that or how you can practice that, essentially, it comes down to your core. And if you've never worked on your core, this is the perfect time because fingers crossed, pools and leisure centers will be opening soon-ish. I don't want to put too, many, too much hope into us, but I'm sure that they're going to be opening soon. Um, and now is the time, you know, about a month, maybe two months before pools are open. Now is the time to really work on that course so that you'll really feel the benefit of that rotation. And the main thing with it is that it's control. So the more control you have of your core, the more control you'll have over the rotation, how far you go, when you stop, and when you come back through again. If you don't have much control of the core, you might feel that your legs and your body are swinging a little bit out behind you. So if you can have some control over the core to move everything together in one movement, to stop at the right time and then to come back through again, that really is ultimately gonna help you with really good flat body position, as well as then being able to take a, a really good breath to the side and, and maintain again, that flat body position. So coming back to, to you then, Tracy, you mentioned briefly about plank and how that was gonna be really good and then the um, side plank as well. So for me, side plank is such a good thing to work on when it comes to this particular skill, because you're moving from one side through the middle and onto the other. So a really good skill is to see if you can keep everything in alignment the whole time. Using a mirror, getting someone to record you as well from one side to the other side is gonna be helpful for you to figure out at what part do you maybe move or what part do you kind of come out of alignment just a little bit. Um, but coming back to you, Tracy, is there anything else in terms of core that people can work on? It's knowing how to engage the core, first of all. So mm -hmm. the best way to do it is get your fingers um, just two fingers like this and you just place them um, just above your pelvis um, and as you breathe in you should be able to squeeze and then you should be able to feel the muscles there and then you're just going to hold it and release it just a touch so that you're not um, overworking so imagine you've got a belt and you're tightening it as far as you can and then you're going to release it just one notch and that's and then you're going to learn to breathe through that so that you don't overwork your core at all times and you've still got energy to do stuff as well. Excellent. Brilliant. And, and any kind of core cool really is going to be really helpful for this. But one thing that I would also mention, and I'm pretty sure Tracy had an exercise for this, was it's not just about working that six pack. Obviously, that's a great potential outcome for working on your core. But we do have core muscles around our back as well. So if we can strengthen that lower part of our back, that's also going to be really helpful. So Tracy, do you have a, an exercise for that? So you'll feel that in your plank anyway, if you're doing it properly, you will feel that but your Russian twists, they're the best one for that because it is about moving the whole body, engaging that core, and you are literally rotating from side to side. And because your arms are extended, you've got that added weight as well so that you're fighting resistance with it. And once you can do it, then you can bring in a ball or you can bring in some weights and then build up the muscles even more. Excellent. Some really good tips there from, from Tracy to really help home. It doesn't have to be straight into sit-ups and crunches and all those kinds of things. Again, if you're just doing the same sort of thing, you're never really going to increase everything. And our core muscles aren't just, you know, the little bit that you can see at the front, they, they do go all the way around. So really working all those different things. And the movement again of the side plank and the Russian twist is going to be really helpful to work on the side core, which is the, the obliques as well, as well as then the core muscles in the front. Thanks very much for that, Tracy. That's really helpful. Emma. Yeah, Questions. can we? Uh, there's a, there's a couple of things that I want to pick up on. Actually, first of all, the poll. Uh, it was a resounding win for freestyle, with 79% of you choosing mm -hmm. freestyle as your main stroke, followed by 19% breaststroke and a mere 1% backstroke, and no one choosing butterfly. <laughs> really? Um, <laughs> which we thought might be the case. 
Um, so interesting stats there. Um, we have got quite a number of questions that are coming in. And I have to say there was a flurry of questions on breathing after we'd already moved on. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe we will leave those and pick those, uh, pick those up at the um, pick those up at the end. Yeah. Um, I've also had some questions about whether we're going to be sharing the exercises and activities that we're talking through. Um, so we will be sending out um, activities along with the link to the recording to everybody that's uh, that's registered today. OK, so just um, reading through some of the questions here about um, body position and rotation. So Tony's asking, can you over rotate to get a good breath? Yeah, so lots of people do over rotate um, because they don't have control of the core. You kind of what happens is your your and usually it's, it's not hip led when people are over rotating. They're starting their rotation either with their neck moving and then shoulders follow and then eventually the hips follow but by the time you've gone that way everything's gone a bit too far so if you can work on your core and you can think about rotation coming from the hips you'll be able to then move across the side I'm going to send a photo with Emma uh, to Emma that she can include within all of this stuff and it's of me swimming on my side and um, or taking a breath on my side and I think a lot of you'd be quite surprised at quite how far I rotate when I take a breath and essentially my, my body is facing the wall when I take a breath, my full body is on its side. That's taken years of practice. I'm not saying that you need to do that straight away, but the more that you can get into that sort of position when you take your breath, the more you'll be able to maintain a flat body position. The problem with not rotating enough when you take that, when you're turning to take your breath is that if it's just your shoulders that are rotating, your head has to move around quite far. So you're putting strain on your neck, you're putting strain onto your shoulders. And also, you're probably not actually going to clear your mouth out of the water if you're trying to stay flat. So what I see a lot of people do is when they turn to take their breath, head lifts up so that they can clear their mouth so they can get air in their mouth. I'm talking now specifically about front crawl and then come back down. So we'd see a lot of people doing seesawing up when they're taking their breath. So to maintain an efficient stroke, especially when it comes through to the breathing, it's about working on that rotation to help you try and maintain a really flat, as flat a body position as possible. Now, there are a lot of you doing breaststroke. It's unfortunately inevitable for breaststroke. We have to lift our head out of the water in order to take that breath. So when it comes to that, if you're looking for efficient breaststroke, the more time you can spend flat, so actually under the water flat in this position, the more efficient you'll be. And when it comes to taking a breath, just think about the higher your head comes out, the higher your head looks forward, the longer it's going to take for it to come back down. So if you can kind of Think about that neutral spine as well. So when you're doing breaststroke, you don't have to look forward to where you're going, especially if you're in a swimming pool, that's usually what the line along the bottom is for us to see. So you don't have to look up forward. You can just bring a nice neutral spine and, and eyes are looking sort of still towards the bottom of the pool or just ahead of you for breaststroke. That will help to bring your body back, body position back into a really good position again after that. So it is possible to over rotate, but the thing that can help you with that is working on that core. Okay, thank you. There's a there's a couple more questions here and someone's made the point that it's difficult, it can be difficult to visualise the exercises when we're talking through them and they want to be able to see them. So I think what you've suggested about the photographs and obviously we have got the activities that we're going to share with you afterwards so that you'll you'll be able to you'll be able to look at them. Um, okay, um, next one then. Can a body type be an inhibitor to efficient swimming, e.g. low body fat muscle giving you poor buoyancy aid? I would say no. Um, we Everyone knows that muscle is heavier than fat. But if you look at, again, some of the best swimmers in the world, they give everyone permission to go and Google pictures of Adam Peaty in a swimsuit on the side of the pool he's a muscly kid <laughs> like that I just call him a kid just because he's younger than me but you know he's he's really muscly there's hardly any fat on him and he floats perfectly I think the thing that I find and, and I'd love to get Tracy's input on this but the thing that I find with people that are maybe a little more muscly is that they're um or a little leaner maybe is that they're so used to working their body that they tend not to be able to relax that much. And when you're in the water, if you're, even if you're lying on your back, even if I'm lying on my back and I tense every muscle in my body or even half of the muscles, maybe just my arms or maybe just my core a little bit too much, I would sink straight to the bottom. 
So what I tend to find with people that are a little leaner, that are, have a little bit more muscle, they're, they're not quite as, as good at relax, or they don't necessarily think about relaxing themselves as much as possible. And the more relaxed you can be in the water, the more you're able to float in the water. Um, that's certainly my, my take on it and the people that I've coached in the past. Tracy, yeah, what, I agree what with you. you? Um, I find that with the leaner swimmers and the muscly ones that they, again, they, they tend to point everything. So they're almost in this, almost as they're standing tiptoe in the pool um, and they think so tight that they can't. And that's why they, they can't relax. And that's why their legs drop down. So it is about putting space, like bending the knee so that the body, the legs are relaxed so that you can get that floating position back up. Okay, um, Sally's asking if you have a back problem and you find core work hard, are there any tips that you can give of how the, the core exercises could be adapted there? Yeah, you can do core exercises sitting in a chair. Um, even like on the webinar right now, you could be sitting here watching it and just pulling your core in, breathing out for 10 seconds and breathing in for 10 seconds. It's really simple to do. Okay, thank you, Tracy. Um, and then Tony's asking, with regards to core work, should it be everyday low, low volume or less frequent high volume? So core goes into every single exercise you're doing and if all the exercise you do, if you're standing up, pull your core in. If you're laying down, pull your core in. Uh, even if you're doing things like arms only in the gym, pull your core in. It's every single day. Okay. I would say that with swimming in general, the, the stronger your core is, the better it will be. Now we've got maybe one, maybe two months until we can get back into our pools, hopefully. Um, that's a really good chunk of time to really focus quite heavily on it. And it doesn't mean you have to spend 45 minutes every single day getting a gym kit on. However many times you boil the kettle a day, how many times you do the washing up, that's a really good opportunity to just, as Trace was saying, just work on that core, just tighten it for, you know, breathe in and then release it, breathe out, tighten it. It's more conscious, I guess, is what we're trying to get you guys to think about with all these different exercises. It's a conscious effort to think about your breathing, a conscious effort to think about your core, which you can be doing, you know, sitting at your desk, set an alarm, you know, every day to just for the next 10 minutes, just think about being, cleaning your teeth. Great, perfect time to do that as well. You know, there's yeah. so many different things that we do. Pick one of them and just do some core every day when you do that particular exercise. A really good one to do is if you need to go to the toilet, walk on your tiptoes because then you're going to have to pull in your core in to keep balance to get to the toilet ideal <laughs> really good okay um rotation question for you from valentina mm -hmm. where does the rotation stem from the hips or the shoulders for me it's it's absolutely the hips it, it, it everything is driven from the hips even your leg kick is driven from the hips um and that's sometimes where you know because swimming is seen as an arm dominated sport even Breaststroke is slightly different. Breaststroke is definitely kind of more from the, from the, the legs where you get more of your propulsion, but backstroke, breast, backstroke freestyle, sorry, everything comes from the hips. And that's why the core is really helpful to be able to maintain the control over the hips. So the hip, the opposite hip, if you're doing freestyle, say I'm gonna be breathing to the right hand side, whilst I'm doing my stroke, the left hip is on its way. That The left hip is the thing that's leading the rotation through to the other side and then the right hip is leading the rotation through the other side again so that whilst I'm swimming everything is coming very much from the hips. Okay thank you um, and Jenny um, asks a specific fly question so with fly if my head goes too deep is that due to my legs being too deep as well? Um, head going too deep I guess maybe the head going too deep is that you're using your head yeah. to swim as opposed to using your core butterfly is the perfect example of where hips and your core are really really helpful so if you feel like your head is going too low that's because you're actively using your head as the thing that's getting you through the water as opposed to keeping that neutral spine and everything coming from you know the, the undulation which is what it's called that part of your butterfly should be coming from core through to your torso and the neck really should just be following in line with everything else so i'd say it's probably your head that's causing that. Okay, Tracy, is there anything else you would want to add to that one? Or has that covered it? No, that's pretty much covered it. The only thing I would say is with fly, um, if you leave with your forehead, so then you're, you won't go too deep into the water because you're automatically, as you come in, you're automatically looking forward to come back up again, rather than looking down towards the bottom. 
Okay, thank you. That leads me very nicely into my next question from Alex. Um, so this is a freestyle one for you, Kerry Ann. So for freestyle, does the should the head and eyes point straight down below our body to the pool's floor rather than at an angle of 45 degrees forward? Yeah, I love these questions. So I am a big believer in working on your body first and doing what's right for you as opposed to reading and watching videos on YouTube. It's really tricky. It's slightly different for everyone. But if we think about what's going to keep us in a nice neutral position in the water, what's going to lift my legs up naturally behind me, generally, you know, if this was my head, my hips and my legs down here, if I was to maintain this flat body position, my eyes ultimately would be looking down. It's not that your eyes have to look down. Your eyes can look forward while you're in the water. We have the ability to look up and to look down, but ultimately your head position will be a huge Will have a huge impact on, on the rest of your legs. One final thing I want to quickly touch on with this is a lot of people think the pivot point in breathing um, or the pivot point in our body when we're swimming is the hips because it's halfway because that's kind of you know the central point of our body when we're on land is the pivot point but actually the things that keep us afloat in the water it's our lungs which are much higher up our body it's the oxygen that's in our lungs that keep us afloat. Now if you imagine one degree up with your head and the pivot point is here rather than down here that's going to be at least four degrees, five degrees of your legs that go down. So it really does make a massive difference. I would say have a go at trialing out a whole bunch of different things, a whole bunch of different positions with your head, with your eyes, pushing it down. You'll feel that the water goes over you. You'll feel a different type of drag, you know, eyes looking down, eyes looking forward, eyes looking out the water. And you'll definitely be able to feel a difference in the back part of your body and then figure out what makes you, each one of you guys here that are watching, what makes you more efficient is, is what I would say. Okay, thank you. Um, Jim's asking, is it a good idea to try and lengthen yourself as much as possible in the water when you're swimming crawl? Yeah, so this is where rotation is really handy as well. And um, I'm not sure I'm gonna be able to show you properly with my chair behind me because my, my camera's up a bit high, but um, essentially what rotation does for us is two things. One, it helps us to be able to take that breath into the side. Um, and keep a nice flat body position. The other thing is it gives us what I call free swimming. So every single stroke that you do, if, um, you know, if you're flat as opposed to then rotating and your body moving around to the side, you move, your body probably gets another half a hand extra every single stroke just by, we're not doing anything extra. The only effort that we're putting in is just that the hips are rotating around just a little more. So that ultimately, when you can rotate to the side, it's gonna give you like an extra half a hand every single stroke. Now, if you imagine that over 50 meters, over 100 meters, 25 meters, over 5K, whatever it is that you guys are taking on as your challenges, half a stroke, every single stroke, essentially, or half a hand every stroke is gonna make a massive difference towards the end of that. So it is really good to make sure that you make the most of that movement, but it's just until you get to that, the end of your rotation, and then you come back through. The problem sometimes with this is that people overreach because they're trying to go too far which means you lose your momentum. So the aim is to get arms into the water till you get to hips essentially getting to the position they want to be in. And then you move back around rather than getting to the side and kicking and waiting and then coming through. It just completely stops your momentum. That's not particularly helpful. Okay, thank you. Right, I'm going to go for one more question on this and then we'll move on to the final section because I've got lots of questions that people have said, <laughs> can you ask this at the end? So sure. last one here from Jitin. Um, one of the things I noticed after getting back into the pool after the first lockdown is the aching from muscles that were previously used regularly in the pool. Most notable in my case was neck pain, I suppose from my breathing. Any exercises to keep the neck and upper body flexible and strong during lockdown? Tracy? These would come in with your um, upper body exercises and your working on your anything to your shoulders. Um, which we're going to cover anyway in the next section. But a good one uh, for you just to do is just to make sure your head's in alignment and then just bring your, your neck just to the side and then down, back up and to the middle again. Um, increase the flexibility both sides. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Right, so we're going to move on to our, our third and, and final section, um, which is propulsion. Great, thank you. So propulsion... I think when we get back into the water, the thing we need to try and get our 
brains out of is trying to get back to the pace that we were already doing you know over at least over a year ago it's going to take some time to build that all back up but what we have the amazing opportunity to do now with this with this getting back in this time is that we have such a good opportunity to do it right so what's going to help you to be able to do it right is to make sure that all the muscles and all the joints are are doing their absolute best for you. So what you can be doing on land now is making sure that the shoulder joints, that the scapula around the back, that the, all the little muscles down your back, they are as strong as they can be and that they're, they're being used so that when you do get into the water, first couple of days, you might feel a bit of pain because the muscles haven't been used in that way specifically before, but we can try and replicate that as much as we can on land. And whilst I was swimming, the thing that really helped me specifically with this was to do yoga was I would suggest you know is another really good thing that you guys can be doing now if that's possible for you to do but also um making sure that we were doing um the exercises that Tracy's going to talk about in a second so it's making sure that the shoulder joints essentially are doing the things that they're meant to be doing that we're using them we're making sure that we're doing it all in the right sort of way as well and that is really going to be the thing that's going to help you make sure that they're strong when we get back in so that we can just focus on getting a really good technique and then we can concentrate on getting faster and um, Tracy over to you I have one more point to make but I'll make that after Tracy's next yeah no worries so um with the propulsion and working shoulders there's quite a lot we can do at home um and you don't need gym equipment to do this you can use a towel or a dressing gown rope anything that you can pull against for resistance um but if you have got bands brilliant um so an overhead pull apart is a really really good one so your arms are literally straight up above you um literally in this position here and you're just pulling out and back in again and like i said a bit of resistance so like a towel just hold the towel at full uh felt make sure your or everything's in nice and tight and then do it that way and you can also do it in front of you and you can do it um behind you as well if you need to so you're getting a full range of all your muscle upper body muscles in there um you can also do the um the lion t lift which, which is where you lie in your tummy um arms out to the sides and then you're just bringing them back behind you in this position here um and tricep dips use a chair tricep dips is a really really good one to do yeah really good again all the core exercises that you're doing plank based as well will be really helpful again to and that's you know why yoga for me was such a good thing to do because it really helped to strengthen all those little muscles you know onto side plank onto the other side plank that kind of stuff even if you have to do that on your knees or on your elbows it's still going to be really helpful for for those for your shoulders the other thing i wanted to mention when it comes to propulsion is is and i'm going to talk about freestyle and backstroke to start with and butterfly as well breaststroke slightly different but still very relevant but for those other three strokes the muscles we want to be utilizing whilst we're swimming, it's really the biggest muscles in our back and that are our lat muscles. And our lat muscles go all the way around the back of our scapula, all the way down, pretty much past where our hips are, around that bit. They're really big muscles. And the great thing is, is they want to be used. They're the muscles that want to be used whilst we're swimming. And it's not that they're big muscles, they're gonna cause a lot of, of effort. Actually, it's gonna do the opposite. Those big muscles are gonna be able to pull you, pull more water well, they're going to help you pull more water every single stroke that you're doing, which again, ultimately will mean that you're doing less strokes per length and will help you to become a more efficient swimmer. If you want to start sprinting, again, a really good thing and the best thing for, for sprinting and swimming for you know harder distances for longer, it's going to be making sure that you're using your lat muscles whilst you're doing that and not just these little, maybe not little, but they are in comparison, you know, our triceps, our biceps, they all contribute towards front crawl but the bigger muscle that we want to be ultimately using um, and, and thinking about and figuring out how we can utilize that, uh, it's the lat muscles, which go all the way down the back end of our body. Now, I'm going to do a little example here. I think Emma might be, a, be the only one that might be able to do this. I don't know if Tracy's got a desk in front of her. And if you're trying this at home, have a, have a go at this as well. So one thing to help you figure this out is if you put both hands out in front of you on the desk in front of you and just push down with straight arms, now, what you can feel there is arms are working, shoulders are working, um, deltoids are working. And you might just feel underneath your armpit, just this bit here, those muscles might just, that's, that's the top of your lat muscles. They might just be working. Now, if I was to ask you to pull yourself without using your leg, pull yourself up from your chair, Emma, do you think you'd be able to do that with straight arms? Without using my legs. Yeah. <laughs> without using your legs. Do you think you do that? 
Oh, no. So what first thing I noticed there that Emma does is she first thing is she comes much closer. And by coming closer, she's bending her elbows. So now if you were to do that again, don't actually lift yourself up off the table. But if you do that, can you feel that you're using more of your lat muscles around your back by coming in closer, elbows above your, your wrists and pulling yourself up? You can start to really feel that you're utilizing different muscles. And it's the same sort of thing when we're in the water. So we're making the most of our rotation when it comes to front crawl. And it's trying to get into that, what we call high elbow position, which essentially is what you were just doing there, but just on one arm. It's about making sure that we're utilizing those lat muscles, which are gonna help pull us through the water. Now, the thing that really helps, helped me, that also helps people that I coach with this specifically is, is thinking about your hand as the anchor. Our bodies, we're not trying to pull our hand past the body. Try and change your focus to think about your hand being the anchor and I'm trying to pull my body past my hand. And by doing that, it really helps a lot of people understand and, and utilize slightly different muscles by thinking about that. Rather than the hand being the thing that we have to move past our body, my hand is staying where it is and my body is moving itself past that hand to help get me through the water. Same sort of thing on backstroke. Again, we're just going to be doing, you know, making sure we get into a good position. And again, that hand being the anchor and I'm moving my body past my hand coming through. And butterfly, same sort of thing again. Hands are the anchor. How can I move my body past, past that bit? Breaststroke, slightly different in that you'll be moving yourself to the side, but still thinking about the lat muscles and how they can help get you through the water. But working on, for all four strokes, working on the shoulder stability, working on those little muscles all the way through the back of your spine and your core, they're all going to be amazing contributors to help you be able to utilize your propulsion as much as possible. Anything else to add to that, Tracy? Yeah, it's not all about um, building your muscle either. You need to work on your flexibility mm -hmm. at the same time. So even if you stand against a wall, uh, drop your chin and then gradually drop every single disc in your spine down so that you're hanging over your hands towards the floor and then slowly back up. It's brilliant for stretching out as well as building up those lat muscles that you were talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Great, that's it. that's it for me. Unless there's anything else that you wanted to mention, Tracy? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay, we have had a question from Colette, which is how do you best engage your lap muscles while swimming, which I think is exactly what you've just covered, isn't it, Kerry? -Ann? Yeah, it's thinking about that, you know, try that on the side of a pool as well before you get going next time and just see the difference between straight arm and using, you know, trying to utilize different muscles and then just trialing it out in the water. I've got a really good exercise for that as well. So um, if you grab hold of a towel or a band um, and almost if you're going to pull a bow and arrow, um and you're just going to twist your body slightly around so you get that full stretch you're going to get it and then you can do the other side as well great okay fabulous right i think what we're going to do now is jump into a load of the questions we've got about 30 odd here i've tried to answer a few as we've been going along and some of them are actually quite similar as well so i'm going to try and group them together um and some of them are going to slightly come away from just fitness swimming. There's definitely a few open water bits in here mm -hmm. that I, I don't think we can get away without covering off. Um, <laughs> but carry on. One of the things you mentioned at the beginning when we were talking about breathing um, was bilateral breathing. And there's a couple yep. of questions in here about um, the, the benefit of bilateral breathing. So mm -hmm. I think what you were saying was it, it's a great skill to have, but it's not absolutely necessary. Yeah. Um, but just, just a question around that really. Yeah, so again, as exactly what Emma just said then, it, it's a great skill to learn how to do. And what it will help you with in the pool is being a bit more balanced. Um, if you only breathe one side, you might find that you become, uh, you might get a little bit more injuries on that side or that you might be veering off just a little bit. But in the pool, you have the line to follow so you can correct yourself in the open water. We don't have that luxury. So you have to kind of, you start to notice things, you might be zigzagging a little bit too much, but being able to bilateral breathe will help with balance. But also what it does is it gives you just a bit of respite. If wind and the waves are just hitting you from the side that you normally breathe in, it's really good to be able to just go, you just get a breath on this side for a little while and then you can come back to that. Yeah, and in the swim doctor sessions, um, we do coach both bilateral breathing and breathing on one side after four or two strokes as well. So we do cover both aspects. Excellent. Okay, um, two or three people are asking about breathing in through your nose or your mouth and whether they're doing it the right way round. Um, and someone even suggesting that when they run, they breathe in with their nose and out with their mouth, should they change over? 
So when it comes to land, so the difference with breathing, um, first of all, it's got to feel comfortable for you. And um, that's the big thing. And, and actually land breathing and running and yoga, it's very much about breathing in the nose and out the mouth. So it is the opposite way around because that works well on land. The tricky thing with breathing in the nose, and this is literally just a practical thing. The tricky thing with breathing in the nose is that you're far more likely to get water up your nose if you're breathing in your nose. The other slightly tricky thing with swimming is that you don't have the luxury of the time to be able to breathe it in. So we do have a shorter window to get that breath in. So what we don't wanna be doing is breathing in too much and forcing it in. Um, but the easiest way that we can get oxygen into our body is by doing it through the mouth. So when you're running, you don't have to change it for running. You don't change it for yoga. But when you come to the water, it would be a really good idea to think about breathing out of your nose. And if the first few times you try it, you really struggle, just start by forcing it out pretend you're blowing your nose in the water because your brain will just need a minute or two to just get used to the feeling of what it feels like but it is slightly different if you've come from a yoga and a running background it will feel like a really strange thing to do but you'll be amazed at how quickly the brain goes huh that's a really good way of doing it why haven't I been doing that all the time because it does really help to regulate the breathing Okay, thank you. Um, there's a couple of different people that have asked questions about panicking um, in the water and in relation to breathing. So what's the best way to kind of break that feeling of burning and panic when you're, you know, when you're breathing, especially when you're going into deeper water? Yeah, so I mean, Tracy might be able to answer this as well for the sessions that she's been doing. But for me, the first thing to work on is that breathing. And it's not just learning how to breathe properly, but learning how to overcome panic as well. Now, like I said earlier, our brains play tricks on us because we have some really deep rooted caveman instincts that we have to overcome. And that is to be able to have constant access to oxygen. When we get older, we our fears uh, increase a little bit. So if you haven't been swimming for a long time and you get in, you might find that you're totally fine as a kid swimming in the deep end. But as an adult, you just have a bit of a fear for that. Could be many different reasons why. But what I would suggest is in the shallow ends, just work out how you can best deal with that panic. And the way that it works for me and my, my clients is, is essentially to be able to turn onto your back, take a couple of deep breaths in, acknowledge that there is a panic there, acknowledge that something is uncomfortable. Because if you try and put a lid on it, it's going to explode at some point and it, that's never going to be a good thing. So acknowledging something's not feeling quite so right here. I'm just going to turn onto my back, take a couple of deep breaths in because meditation um, and, and breathing and all that kind of stuff, the act of relaxation essentially is the breathing out bit. So the more that we can get our brains and our bodies to act actually actively breathe out and breathe out for a few seconds, four or five seconds while we're on our back. So a deep breath in to activate a deep breath out that activates our relaxation hormones and that helps our body to get over the panic that we're in. So as quickly as you can, getting onto your back and then think about filling the lungs, emptying them four or five times. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna trigger that relaxation so we can get over the panic our brains can then go back to logic, thinking about the problem at hand as opposed to just being in caveman, like oh, some tiger's gonna try and eat me, which essentially is what your brain is doing. It's going, <laughs> I'm gonna die. It's not, it's just how quickly can we get our brains out of that position and then get back into swimming. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> when I, I, when I teach, it all uh, when I teach um, to go in towards the deep end and panic I tend to kind of get in with somebody and then have them in the deep water holding on to the side and then get them to breathe out and go under the water and then come back up nice and slowly so that they there's almost that calm feeling there yeah same thing again just the trigger of, of releasing that panic getting rid of that panic changing so there's two parts of the brain front part is logic uh creativity problem solving which we want to spend time in that's going to help you learn how to swim better or there's the back part of the brain, which is panic, which is you know, the oldest part, which is the caveman instincts. And you can't be in both at the same time. So once the switch has gone to the back, you can't think logically. So we need to get you back out of that so you can go back to thinking about it logically, problem solving, rather than just being in a pure panic state. Yeah. Okay. Um, Colette asks how, that we're getting onto some open water stuff now. How do you best control your breathing in choppy open water? Uh, with this one, I think this is sometimes where I'm um, working on breathing and I'm not talking about necessarily spending a lot of time working on hypoxic breathing, but if you can get used to 
the feeling of maybe missing a breath every now and then because that sometimes might happen you know when you're going for a run and you swallow a fly or something you kind of miss a breath what you do is you generally just cough it out take a second and then you can go again similar sort of thing if it's really choppy you just have to first of all try and relax as much as you can because the more tense you get the more likely you are to swallow water but if you can be calm with it as well and just know that you know if I miss a breath if I turn to take a breath and there's a wave there and I don't get it in it's not the end of the world. I know that I can do another two, another three strokes and try and get a breath on the other side or try again on that same side to get a breath in again. So where um, breath holding, a bit of hypoxic work can come in handy is, is with this bit, but I would only ever encourage someone to work on that when their breathing is nailed. If you are still struggling with your breathing, the first thing you should be working on is nailing the breathing so it feels calm, confident, relaxed. And then you can take a step into working on breathing every five, maybe pushing it. And I'm talking like maybe 50 meters or 25 meters working on that and working your way up. But certainly don't go too much past seven unless you're really experienced in it. But again, it's just the only reason that that's going to be helpful is that if you do, if you're in choppy water and you turn to take a breath and you miss it, maybe a wave hits you, you don't get a chance to breathe in. It shouldn't panic you because you know that I'll just take another couple of strokes and I'll try again. In a second. Okay, lovely. Thank you. And whilst we're on open water, John asks, what do you recommend for sighting forwards when in open water? Presumably this needs a head lift and neck flex. Yes, absolutely. So for, unfortunately, it's inevitable for us in open water to have to look forward to see where we're going. A couple of things I would say is try and limit it as much as possible and I'm not talking about stop looking up I'm talking about how high your head comes that's the first thing that you should really be thinking about is how high your head is coming out of the water if you're coming out to take a breath looking forward the amount of effort strain and energy that you're going to have to do is going to be exponential over a long distance so there is this thing called crocodile eyes which I always think is not a great analogy if we're thinking about open water and say, <laughs> hey that's just me but essentially, if you've ever heard of crocodile eyes, essentially it's just your eyes come out of the water because we don't need our noses or our mouths to see. We just need our eyes to see. So if you can try and limit the amount that your head lifts out, so not breathing and looking, because again, if it's wavy, you don't know if a wave's going to hit your mouth. So we never want to interfere with breathing. So make sure your breathing is always to one of the sides and sighting, the most efficient way to do it, sighting happens just before you take your breath. So it's about making timing it so that if I'm breathing to the right hand side, again, if I'm breathing that way, I'm gonna be sighting when my right hand is on its, um, on its pull down so that when I look up, I'm taking, so I'm not breathing and sighting on the same side. My right arm is coming down. I'm looking up to take a breath, but my left arm recovers over and enters the water. I can then take my breath as normal. So I'm not interfering with my breathing. Sighting is happening just before that. There's a couple of different ways of sighting though. That I would say is the most efficient because it's just saving a little bit of energy and effort, but there's actually nothing wrong with looking up, coming down, taking your breath or the other way around, which is looking, taking your breath beside and then looking forward. The only thing I'd say with that one is you have less control over how high your head comes because you don't know when the waves are coming. So that's why the other one is slightly more efficient because you can see when you see, you know when you've seen essentially and then you can turn and take your breath to the side. And how often should you be sighting? What would your advice be? Um, it's a really good question. And I wish I had a golden answer for it, but I don't. It's very dependent on what your goal is. If I was to give you an example, my goal when I was racing was probably not a surprise, was to win. <laughs> that was my goal and my aim. So I had to make sure I was on the racing line. I was in the middle, you know, doing exactly what I needed to do and needed to know where everyone was. And I technically only wanted to swim 10,000 meters because let's be honest, that's far enough. I did not want to be swimming 11,000 meters and wasting the energy. So for me, I sighted, I used to sight every sixth breath, I would say, and I used to breathe every two. So I was sighting quite a lot, which is why I had to make sure I was doing the most efficient way of sighting so that I wasn't gonna you know, be putting myself under too much pressure sighting that many times over a 10K. But that was my goal. My goal was to make sure I was on the racing line. I knew where everyone was and I was keeping as fast as I possibly could, especially coming down that last straight. So I was on a straight line to hit the touch pad at the end. If your goal is to finish a swim and you've been working really hard on your body position, you don't need 
to look up anywhere near as much as that. You might be looking up every 10th, 15th breath. But what you need to know with that is, are you a snaker? Do you go zigzagging? You know, a really good way of figuring that out is when we do get a chance to get back into the open water is just to either close your eyes for 20 strokes, have someone with you, but close your eyes for 20 strokes essentially. And then just see what, aim for something and then do your 20 strokes without looking and then see where you end up. If you veer off to the right or you veer off to the left, you know there's something specific that you need to work on, either working on correcting yourself to the left or the right. And that will help you know whether you need to sight a little bit more. Because if you're constantly going within 20 strokes, if you're almost facing a quarter turn a different direction, you probably need to sight a little bit more to make sure you can stay on online. Um, so it really is very dependent on what your goal is and, and the aim of, of what your swim is all about. Okay, thank you. Well, we are um, right at the end of the session now, and I know there are a few questions that we've not had time to get round to. So I'm just going to do one last one. And that is there are a number of people that have asked around um, low impact uh, cardio exercises um, and any advice that either of you can give on that, whether struggling with injuries to knees and um, Achilles and things like that. Yeah, we can get some, um, I can give you some exercises we can put up for everyone to see, some low impact ones. Mainly it'd be based around sitting on a chair um, and doing um, work from a chair. We can still do some cardio work sitting on a chair. Okay, final one, someone's asked, are there any exercises that are not good for swimmers? Good question. Um, or maybe we'll just leave it there then. <laughs> good question. There are, it's, if you're not stretching afterwards, then building up the muscles is just really, really bad for swimmers <laughs> yeah. because it stops the rotation. Yeah. To so stretch out afterwards. Okay. Thank you both. Um, Okay, well, thank you, everybody. We've come to the end of our, um, our session. It's gone really quickly and there's definitely lots more that we could have talked about and more detail we could have gone into. Um, it would be a shame to leave this without a, a plug for our swimming pools for when they reopen. Um, so just a reminder, um, if you are not a member of a better leisure centre, we do operate um, nearly 150 pool facilities um, up and down the UK. And we have our Better Swim UK membership, which is £32.50 a month and you can swim in any of our pools as many times as you want so we will share information with you about the exercises that Tracy's talked through today and some diagrams so that you can try them at home um, the uh, images that Kerry anns promised as well uh, and also some information for you regarding um, our local facilities and, and membership offers as well um, so all it remains for me to do is to say thank you very much for joining us from wherever you are. And for those that are watching back, we hope that you've enjoyed it as well. Um, thank you very much to Kerry ann and thank you to Tracy for joining us. Um, and hopefully we'll see you again on one of these soon. Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you yeah. very much. Bye.